Welcome to this edition of On Education. I'm Jennifer Horn. Today we will be discussing the difficult issue of students dropping out of school before they have earned a degree. The New Hampshire State Legislature has been grappling with this issue for years. HB 18 is new legislation that would mandate attendance through the age of 18. It is currently being considered by the House and Governor Lynch has committed to signing it into law if passed. Let's start by listening to what some students who have already dropped out of school have to say. Educators, parents, and state officials wrestle with the perpetual problem of preventing students from dropping out of high school. We asked students who didn't complete high school what their reasons were for dropping out. Um, I had a reputation and uh, it followed me from junior high here and then just escalated and I also got into a lot of trouble last year. I uh, skipped a lot and it, I missed so much that it turned out I wouldn't graduate till 2010. I had a medical condition, mm -hmm. so I never really got to show up for school. My attendance was like 30 days a year. It was terrible, I got headaches, put me in and out of the hospital, things like that. I dropped out because I wasn't having enough credit to graduate this year and I got a lot of opportunities to do touring and such so I figured I'll just go to night school instead so I, tr I dropped out and then after like a week of being dropped out I transferred into night school so now I take night courses to get my diploma. Uh, I, I had a lot of stuff going on like um, when I first in ninth grade I, I was uh, they said I didn't pass eighth grade and they told me I had to leave the school and and a lot of confusion got there, and I was from the get-go. I was way behind, and just from there, I just lost motivation to just come back and come in every day and try to get my credit back. And School just got boring, and I thought that hey, I already know enough. Why not? I can go out and get a job. Well, like I found, like I was so far behind that there was no use in me catching up. So I thought my best, I like thing was to drop out. The process of withdrawing from high school varies from student to student, whether it is obtaining a GED or trying to earn a diploma in some other way. First I was going to get my actual diploma through night school, so I went to Miss Henry in the Career Center, but it would cost over $2,000 to do it that way. So that wasn't an option. I went home with a piece of paper for my dad to sign, and he's like, I'm not signing that, you're not in the college yet and you're not working yet. And I'm like, well, I have classes set up and I'm not going to them. It's completely pointless, so you don't sign this paper. It's your problem. Um, for a while, I just stopped, and then I called him and told him I wasn't going to attend anymore and just stopped it right there. I actually took my pre-GED, uh, like, two days after I dropped out. I came back and took it at South. I'm lucky because I'm really good at the academic stuff. So I, got a, I took the GED, and I got, like, the highest recorded score in state history. Yeah, my guidance counselor told me, like, she, she called me in her office one day and she, just, she was real, like, straight with me and she just said, you're not going to graduate on time this year. And she, like, she laid out my options for me and that was one of the options. So I just talked to, I, I was already going to night school anyways, but I was going as a daytime student just to, like, get extra credits so, like, I could go to college and stuff. But and then they told me I could transfer there full time. So I just got all the information for that. And After the students leave high school, many tried to find work, which often proves to be difficult. Um, I had to wait a little while before I could start looking for a job because of a system. I had to let it clear out and stuff because I was into drugs for a while. And uh, now I'm looking for a job, and on the 20th this month, I start at the Technical College on Amherst Street. Um, I'm actually looking for work, and I'm uh, hopefully going on tour with my band this summer. It's a job I had in high school. I'm still doing it now. It's just a retail job until I like start finding a full-time job. But like this summer, touring is going to be my income. So I'll be making a decent amount of money off that. I did start working at McDonald's, but after a little while, like a month or two, uh, they fired me for not coming in. Mm -hmm. It's becoming very difficult, and thinking about it, if I want a really good job, I need to have a high school diploma. I just put in my application, and none of them would answer me back, and that was it. Like, I don't know, maybe because they don't want to like hire somebody that dropped out of high school, they prefer to hire somebody in one. 
Many of these former students quickly realized the importance of having a degree. Um, when I first started thinking about dropping out last year, college wasn't in my plan. Um, but as time went on, I decided to go that route. All the jobs that you can get without any degree or anything, I'm not cut out for. Even before I knew I had to drop out, I always told myself I was going to college. And it's not really just selfishness, it's that, you know, I want to make at least 50 grand a year. At least. And you can't in this, in this country without a college diploma, really. I want to graduate and I want to become a nurse and like uh, my mom has eight, she had eight kids and none of them graduated so it would be very important to me. I was actually looking at the tech school or UTI because I want to go into automotive. Influences to drop out can sometimes stem from the teen's home environment. Uh, majority of my family is dropouts. Um, my uncle, my mom, my dad, my grandparents, like it goes down a huge list of people who didn't graduate and none of them went on to school. It really didn't come as too much of a surprise for them that I wasn't doing good in school. I have, I've all, I have three brothers and two of them have dropped out as well and I have two and one of my brothers has graduated high school. So I, they weren't really surprised to see them rubbing off on me as I got older and pretty much followed the same path that they did. Most of my friends at the time weren't going to school. They were already dropouts. And I just pretty much wanted to go hang out with them more and rather than be cooped up seven hours a day. And so I figured when I drop out, I'll be able to go hang out with them, make money, and you know, do what every kid likes to do. Other influences come from the bad habits the teens had in school or the stress of the school environment itself. When I got there, like, the work was real hard and sometimes the teachers weren't paying attention to me. So, like, I felt like if they didn't pay attention to me and they didn't care, like, why should I? And, like, I just started slacking on my work and then I wouldn't go to school. It's just, uh, I, I had about roughly, like, six credits in my junior year, so it was, like, way behind. and. It, I, like even if I took night school, it wouldn't have. It would still have taken pretty much just as long. And obviously, I have to take some of the blame for it because I can't be like, "Oh, school is terrible. It's all their fault." Blah blah blah. Like, I there was a lot of days I didn't show up. I I gave myself a lot of vacation time, but I don't like. There's something about the classes. Like, I just didn't like. I don't like waking up in the morning and like the classes had like 30, sometimes almost 40 people in it. So like, you it's real hard to get things done. You just kind of like you sit there with a notebook and like you just get told what to do and like sometimes you weren't even learning things. And then like if classes got cut, you kind of got thrown into classes. Like I got thrown into a couple classes this year and so like if you get thrown into a class, you're probably not going to like it. And that was my case and like if I didn't, if I didn't like it, I wasn't going to be interested in it. And since it was electives, I was like I don't need to take this and I don't want to take this. So it was just really hard to like get on track. It's like I was in foundation classes and it's just like it's so hard to just concentrate and like, it's weird like in a foundation class it's so much different from any other class because like you could like have a piece of paper and they they tell you to bring it home and if you just brought it in the next day and just wrote down random answers they they give you the credit for like you didn't even you could have wrote anything on the paper and they would have just accepted it and like yeah. oh yeah whatever you did at least you tried and it just they they help not motivate me either because like it just if you just hand someone a piece of paper and tell them to write something on it and then give them a good grade, it just doesn't make you feel good about yourself. And Some teens find the alternative education or night school works better for them than the traditional high school setting. Me, for me, I was so close to graduating, but I was just like, I was close but not close enough. And I didn't, like, I, I, I was thinking about you getting my GED, but somebody told me that you can get your diploma through night school. And I was like, well, I'm a senior. I was halfway through my senior year. I was so close. Why not just go the full mile and get it and it's like two nights a week for me because I had enough credits in high school to transfer those over. Like at ALT it's a little more easier because it's just you and like a couple other students and the teacher and you get to learn the teachers like on a more of a personal level than what you would at the high school. I think a normal high school would have been probably more challenging for me because the teachers usually don't come up to help you if you need it. It's usually they're running around the class and uh, unlike Clearway and ALT, if you need help, the teacher's right there when you ask for her. Other teens feel school just isn't cut out for everyone. 
obviously, like, just not going and not paying attention in class and doing stuff like that, I mean, obviously it's not good, but, I mean, just some people can't handle stress about, like, schoolwork and trying to stay on top of things, like, at home. And, like, I, I have plenty of stuff going on at home that it just makes stuff harder. And it's just, I like, I wouldn't encourage anyone to drop out. It's just... For some people, that's what you got to do, and there's other ways around it to still get an education and go somewhere in life, and it's not like your life's over if you drop out of school. Governor Lynch has recently proposed a bill to increase the compulsory attendance age from 16 to 18. How do the teens feel about this bill? I think it's a real bad idea, to be honest. Like, I thought it was a bad idea as it is. Like, When I dropped out, I was 17, so I had to have my parents come in and like sign a bunch of paperwork with me, and it just seems kind of silly. Like. I mean, at the same time, I think you should have parental consent, but I think, like, you're, if you're the one going to school, you should be able to choose whether you stay in or not. So, like, if you want to drop out, you should be able to just walk in, sign some papers, and be done with it. It's like it's something you have to think about, but I don't think, if you're 18, half the people that graduate aren't 18 their senior year. Like, I, I don't turn 18 until the summer, so it wouldn't have affected me at all. It would have just taken up more time, and I would have wasted more of the government's time and school's time. Well, I think it's a good decision, but in a way, hey, if someone wants to drop out, let them drop out and then see what they're going to miss later on. Teach them maybe a little lesson. And there's other kids that don't have medical conditions. Like, maybe they have something else going on. Well, yeah, GED is great. And, you know, maybe the school system would be better if the kids that really didn't want to go to college, like, you wait until the kid's, like, 16 or 17, have them decide on whether or not they want to go or whether or not they can go. And if they don't or they just want to go to a trade school or community college, take the GED and leave. It leaves more resources for the people that want to move on. What would be the effects of this bill if it was implemented? I think it would cause a lot of problems. Like, people would just start getting real irritated and fed up, and, like, people just wouldn't show up. Like, there's ways to get around it. Like, there's some rule, I don't know what the exact deals are, but if you've missed, like, 30 days in a row, then you're automatically just, like, they take you off the school's roster, and you're no longer a part of it, and, like, I think like people will find ways around it. Like if people don't want to go to school, they're not going to go to school, whether it's like government documented or not. They're just not going to go. Yeah, it, I think it'd be think, just like a waste of time, pretty much, just sending your kid into school to just sit at a desk and just not do anything. I'd I'd rather see like if I had a kid personally, I'd rather see him drop out, get his GED, and start working and doing other things, and just sitting at a desk, just handing in papers that say he doesn't even know what he's talking about. Some students who drop out believe they can ultimately pursue a successful life. Um, I think it really won't matter for the most part. I mean, if I go back and I get my diploma and everything, you know, show them that I'm actually trying, and no, I really don't think it would make a difference. There are some cases where dropping out doesn't lead to the end of an education. I, wanted, I always wanted to go to college. My dad gave me the name of some, like, really well-known Irish attorney that went to Boston College Law School. He gave me the name of this guy named uh, Father Woods. I talked to the priest, told him my story, told him all this stuff. He had me fill out an application, give him a copy of the GED, and uh, they looked at it, and I was in. It might actually make more sense for some students to obtain a GED. And this is the sad thing, actually. If you just get a high school diploma, they look at a GED just as well. It's almost pointless. And this is going to sound really bad, but it's almost pointless to complete high school if you're not planning on going to college. However, it is a different story if you want to attend college. I mean, because it, if you weren't sick or anything, and you want to go to a school like that, you stay in high school. Because then you get to follow the program. Although dropping out of high school is not considered a desirable choice, the perception of dropouts as people who give up may be changing. It appears most students know the importance of some kind of degree and have plans to earn them. I think a lot of them like are maybe like have a plan to go back to high school if they can, if it's not too late, or if not, like go for their GED, or if they want to do things in their life. It's my pleasure to welcome to our panel today, Principal from Nashville's Alt School, Patty Place, Mr. Mike Dolphin, your guidance counselor at Londonderry High School, and Mr. Brian Sorgan, who is the attendance officer here for the Nashville School District. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you for making time you. today. Um, that series of video clips really made an impression on me. I'm sure it did on all of you as well. Uh, what really struck me, and Patty, maybe you can speak to this first, the children that you work with at the what we call the Alt School here in Nashua, 
um, are the kids who are most at risk for dropping out. Um, and I was really struck by the idea that there is no stereotype of who these kids are at the wide range of, you know, children who have faced medical problems, children who have faced social problems, children who face academic problems. There's, there's really a much broader range of children at risk for dropping out than I realized. Yes, so. absolutely. Um, I try to explain to people that, that students come to our school for many different reasons. We have enrolled at any given time about 112 students. Um, they come for sometimes medical reasons. They come because they have uh, failed academically. So many students come in with straight F's or three or more F's in core curriculum subject areas. So they have failed their grade level. They come in for family systems issues. Some come in with substance abuse issues. Um, some come in for behavioral issues. We take students for any, any reason that they can't make it in a traditional large school. In Nashua, the majority of our schools, be they um, junior, middle school level schools or high schools, are very large. And one size doesn't fit all in education. And we try to give a smaller classroom setting and more of an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one learning with students that struggle with academics or their behavior or any other issue. Uh, the alt school is not the only alternative education option for students who don't stay in the regular high school in Nashua, right? Correct. We have, we have Clearway and we also have night school. Correct. It sets up, tell me what the differences are between those two programs. Clearway is an alternative high school at this point um, that is run through the Adult Learning Center and it's an excellent program for students that want to get a, a, a diploma and it's an alternative school similar to ours um, except it does have a shortened day, but you can get credits to, towards your diploma and graduation. Uh, the night school program is run at Nashua High North with Michelle Papanicolau, and it is also another way to get a diploma through either combining your day school credits or through night school itself. But it sounds like with the night school there is a tuition to be paid, a fee to be paid. Correct which as opposed to attending the day school, obviously, where public education is, there's no Correct. charge to it. But the interesting so. thing is it's, it forms a continuum of services for our learners, so it gives options to students that haven't been able to function in, in a regular day school traditional model. Now, Mike, you've been very involved in um, the whole process of following this legislation in Concord. Uh, HB 18, if I, and you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, is going to, would mandate that students must be in some form of, it, of school situation through the age of 18. It seems like common sense legislation to me that we say our children should stay in school through the end of their high school years. But not everybody supports it. Not all teachers and not all guidance counselors, not everyone in the education a community supports this legislation. Yeah, so it was Senate Bill 268 last year when the governor proposed it. But when he proposed it, he did not allocate any monies. So even though I've always supported kids staying in school, I testified against the bill. Now he's changed the uh, number on the bill, but the money is still minimal. Because of all the issues in the tape that we all see, there's no ODAP office anymore, al alcohol drug office in Concord. There's no social workers in the schools. We do have an adult education program at Londonderry that serves the region as well. And that's just like in, in uh, Patty's program, does the same type of thing, and a lot of our kids graduate. But again, it's the capacity. It's nice that all the kids should graduate and they all go to high school, but imagine the state counts a GED as a drop-up under the classification. A GED means that that student has attained something and they can go on to college with that, but yet the state of New Hampshire calls that child a dropout. That's a good point, and I hadn't thought about that, who we're, who we're including in these numbers. Do you know the numbers, uh, Mike, are you familiar, what, maybe statewide, what number of students are we dealing with when we talk about kids who are dropouts? I could have guesstimated, but about four or five years ago there was a study, and there was an average of 25% in the state. Wow. And it's gone down a little bit because obviously, um, you know, they targeted the urban areas, Manchester, Nashua, but they've worked feverishly to try to do all sorts of alternative programs at just like in Nashua and Manchester, so forth. I don't think that the problem is certainly, you know, in the schools, there's always going to be traditional schools that don't fit with kids, but every child, all of us at this table can remember someone that had a positive influence on us, and as well as someone that may not have, and it's still a people difference. If the, if the counselors at Nashua High School have 450 kids they're responsible for, all the, all the things that the students talked about in the tape, 
can happen to develop that relationship, that personal relationship with somebody that's going to help them, you know, right from the very beginning. And so much when we talk about who's going to guide us and keep us on track, so much, so much of this goes back to the home. And before we get into talking about family issues that contribute to this, um, you talked about funding. The, one of your issues with the HB 18 is that it doesn't come with funding. You're talking about monies to support alternative school programs, Clearway type of programs, or are you talking about additional fundings going into the mainstream schools? Well, I think the state needs to step up. It's a problem in post-secondary education. It's a problem for the adequacy bill. It's a problem. We go back to having a local property taxpayer. So depending upon the town, depending upon the city, it's the same formula that's been in existence. And this is my 31st year in the business. Nothing has changed. The state of New Hampshire has never come to bat for the child in terms of funding. Never. Not any governor prior. The, education, the first education governor was Jean Shaheen. She had one summit, nothing came of it. Governor Lynch had one summit, nothing came of it. So when are we going to, to start doing something at the state level to fund all of these programs? When is the Office of Drug and Alcohol Prevention going to reopen? Which we all know, being in the business, the use of drugs and alcohol is a major problem, not just within the home, but these kids bring these problems to school, whether they're users themselves or whether they're children of users. You're the first person to kind of make this connection I had, in my presence. I hadn't thought of it. Uh, this whole issue of defining adequacy in education, I haven't heard anybody in that, conversa in, in that conversation talk about the percentage of kids that are dropping out of high school before they finish. And it, it, certainly they, need, they go hand in hand. You know, we're obviously not providing an adequate education to all of our students. No, a lot again, some of the comments in the tape are very appropriate. You know, Patty's program and a few other programs in the state do take risks and do take the student out of the traditional environment. But what about extended learning opportunities? What about credit off campus? Some, some school officials in the state don't want to deal with that. We do a, va a variety of things in Londonderry, and I did when I was in Hudson at Alvern for 15 years, same thing. Let's look at independent studies. Let's look at career work experiences, the vocational programs that exist you know, all over the region. You know, we even have a program at Londonderry where kids can go to college their senior year and get dual right. credit. But it's, you have to be willing to take risks. And sometimes you take risks as an adult in the state. Even if you're in education, you sometimes get criticized because of that. But every single child that makes it to a GED or to a two-year school or graduates from adult ed is going to remember Patty or somebody like her that said, hey, I've got, I want to talk to you, but you do have options. I do? Just like one of, the, right. one of the young men said in the tape, there are options for kids well beyond just taking more classes in the old so-called so credit recovery. And I think um, I, I agree with Mike on one level that this is an adequacy issue, but that's, that's a statewide issue we have on many different levels. I think for me the reason I've always supported this dropout bill that the governor's proposed and I testified last year before the legislature and this year and I'm going to be testifying next month I think is because philosophically as an educational leader and someone who's been in the business for 23 years working with high risk folks that this is the right thing to do. The right thing in my opinion is to raise the dropout age to 18 and yes we do need to have funded programs and, and work toward establishing alternative continuums and like Mike said extended credit recovery extended course options. Um, we can look to many different states within the nation and see that they've established different continuums. Going to conferences you see different options, you know, reading, keeping up on research and, and the literature. You can see that other states have struggled with the same issue and made decisions. But I think the first step forward is to philosophically agree that students should not be able to have the option to leave the educational process until they're 18. Research is very, very specific that if you do not have a diploma, that your, your opportunities are very, very limited in life. Well, and there's no question. And we saw that yeah. a lot of the students who have dropped out have learned that lesson very quickly. And statistics I mean, all show very young. that if, if you don't have a diploma, you're more likely to end up in prison, on welfare, or dead. And those are all very expensive propositions. Also, and you're very distressing up exactly as well, and and expensive. You know, to incarcerate an average national average for incarcerating an offender right now is about twenty five thousand dollars a year. So you pay now by adding a little bit more to the pot 
to educate someone and you know form an alternative continuum with vocational options with everything that Mike said and in many ways Mike and I are closer I think in in our in our agreement with each other than disagreeing um, and we're both child-centered and and hoping that that kids will have options and and learners will succeed but if we establish that and pay the little it is for that we won't have to pay welfare we won't have to have those big ticket items you know pumped into our community as we as we get grow good citizens that's what we're trying to do right and as part of that process all three of you are closely involved with the students brian you're called the attendance officer sometimes they call you the, the truant officer which i think just doesn't sound very nice but you're interacting with, you're not nice isn't it? Uh, we're in, you're interacting with these students one-on-one, -on -one, up close. Um, first set up for us, explain to us exactly w what the truant officer does so that people understand. <clears throat> um, basically, I get a referral from the principals and make a home visit to get the student into school. And this starts from first grade on. Um, so I'm you seeing... You deal with first graders? I deal with first graders, wow. second graders, all the way up. There's 13,000 kids approximately in the district, one truant officer. So I don't have time or energy. Or I try, I'm the bad guy, let the schools be the good guy, uh, basically. But I look at this as they're trying to build a house, the roof first. We don't have public kindergarten. These kids' habits are starting, and every one of those kids said they fell behind. Right. They're falling behind well before high school, because I bet a lot of them, they're... Um, habits and structure started in first grade in the patterns of missing school or whatever and then it grows up by the time they get to the high school in middle school they're so far behind but in their set in their ways they've said to their parents I don't want to go to school today okay you don't have to go and that's been set I have kindergartners first grade is out 80 days that wow. I report to the uh, DCYF. I take the parents to court for duty of a parent. Um, right, that's what I was going to say. Battle. That's a parental issue there. Right. Now, as truant officer, are you a um, an employee of the police department or of the school district? The school department. Of the school district. So, and you're seeing these students at home. You're yes. going home and tracking them down. I was really struck by the number of students in that video at the beginning of the show who talked about my uncle, my grandmother, my mother, my father were all dropouts. My two of my three brothers were dropouts. Um, the, you, you cannot argue the tremendous influence that families have on their children and on their students. And when you talk to me about first graders who I'm have been out of school for eight I'm doing the second and third generation. I've been doing this so long. I think that that's I know the shocking. grandparents. I dealt with them. How do we address that, though? What, and you, you, the, you suggested already I got a kindergarten. Ton of we need to have public. You have a lot of time. I have a lot of time. <laughs> it seems to me that that this is the root of the problem. If we have students who are in first and second grade who just aren't showing up at school, then we have a parent problem. We right. have a parent who's not getting their children to school. Right. How do we and begin to address that? It's not easy. And a lot of the families I go to, they, it's a single parent, unfortunately. And they're behind the eight ball already. I have. But is it a single parent children. who's going off to work for the day and leaving a first grader no, no, at no, home? No, no, no. But it's hard, and I and I understand the parent. It's difficult. As a parent, I see it. Now there are two of us, and it's a team effort. We always say it's a team effort bringing up these kids. Um, first grader doesn't feel well. Stomach ache, belly ache, whatever. Okay, you can stay home today. The parent doesn't want to get up. They don't get the kid off to school student might have to walk to school through some tough areas right. on a cold rainy day I don't want to go I don't blame you you know they don't have the resources to get the student to school because they might be a walker having a six-year-old walk oh, half yes. a mile or, or further some of them right, right. you know and, and um, what Brian's referring to is that the family systems are in crisis a lot of times the families that we deal with they're overwhelmed with many different you know variables often um, poverty and they're below the poverty line or on free and reduced lunch that's a variable that many of them have. I just heard a statistic on the air this week that we're dealing I think in our school district with a third or more of our students correct. are living below the federal poverty line correct and how that contributes to it and is that your experience when you're out in the homes that that's that do we have a disproportionate number 
of these st at-risk students or students who are dropping out are coming from families that are below the poverty line? I believe so. And, and yeah. it, would and it I, seems like it would make sense. And I, you know, and it's, I get frustrated because, again, you do it so long, and you feel for these kids, but I, I call it, it's tough love. Right. You know, I'm sorry about your problems. We got to get this student into school so the guidance counselors can do their thing, so the teachers can do their mm -hmm. thing. They're the nice people. Right. I have to pry that student from the home that they love that environment because that's what they know and get them into the building and let them do the, let the teachers do their magic. That right must then. really pull at you sometimes. I mean, that sounds like a very difficult it's, situation to be in, especially with young elementary school children. It, it, it does, but I've, I laugh a lot. I never have a bad day because I get a great family and I keep saying I get a great family. I'm right. going to help this student achieve that goal. Is, the, is this a situation where we need more interaction, more actual physical dialogue and interaction between families and schools? Well, I think it's difficult, as Patty will tell you, for these, some of these parents, these challenged parents, to advocate for themselves. They really have a difficult time speaking up. And, and so, and as we both said before, I feel every child is a miracle. And just like Brian, I'm the truant officer for, Lon truant officer for Londonderry High School as well as the guidance director <laughs> at the same You're time. You're wearing two hats. Right. So I try to come across in different ways and scare them and file right. reports with the division. But the problem is if you don't have social workers in the district that can do right. home visits to supplement and get to some of these issues, where is that money coming from? The burden is still on the property taxpayer. Of course I want every child to stay in school. I want every child to go to college because with a GED or adult diploma or high school, they can. Right, those community, options open community up. Community system is awesome in the state. Right. But, you know, my wife's a second grade teacher. She already can tell me who the dropouts are. Just That's like Brian can, can see knows. I can, I can in second grade. down the list. First, second graders, and say, that one's gone, that right. one's gone, that one's gone. Oh, that is too sad. I, I, I mean, we can't accept that as a community. And, that, that's just heartbreaking. And parents don't say, gee, I want my right. kid to drop out. Of gee, I not. want my right. kid to be a drug addict. And no, no student says, I really want to you know, be into drugs, or I really you know, don't want to succeed in life. I think everyone wants to succeed. But we have just one model, so it's hard if you're not, if you're the round peg in the square hole, you don't fit into the model. So we have to create opportunities. We have to instill hope in the future. We have to, like, be the, you know, the capacity for, for people to overcome their obstacles and give them a process w within which to succeed. Now, you keep referring often, Mike, back to funding. Is the issue in your mind that we are not putting enough money into the system as a state or that we are not spending it where it needs to be spent, we're not spending well, it efficiently? Both. First of all, there's not enough money in the state. We were talking before the show just about the post-secondary issue. Imagine the University of New Hampshire is going to be $20,000 next year for an in-state resident. We can go to University of Florida as a Florida resident for $3,500. Right. So that's, it's the same it's problem. Different. You know, it's if if the governor and the state department of ed talked to people and talked to these kids or watched this tape, they would realize that every one of those those students on the tape is a miracle, is special, has special talents to offer. So, where are the social workers? Where are the K through 12 education programs on, on substances that should be mandated? You no know, child left behind. All testing, 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 testing. It's all of the funding is based on test scores, and normally the special ed populations bring down the test scores. As it is, the poor kids are already struggling academically, and now we don't get funded. We get on a school for improvement list. Of course, the state newspaper will print that list. Right. But where are the mandated programs coming from Washington? President Bush has failed miserably, and I wrote him a letter two years ago and said, you're not thinking about the child. You're thinking about testing. Testing and assessment, maybe it worked in Texas, but it doesn't work in the United States. From the time they come in, at least in third grade, by the time they're 10, they can understand on a continuum and developmentally what substances are. And if you do something with them every year, right through 12th grade, they can make decisions. And sometimes, as all three of us know, sometimes we're the parent. Sometimes we're the dad or the mom to that particular child because the family system is so broken. Well, I don't want to... Um uh, be too negative on the benefits of the testing because I think that it plays a role in all of this. I think that there's a, a re I think that there's a real benefit to the testing as far as 
um, evaluating the academic success of the school, and that it has to be a piece of the pie, I guess. A but balance, saying, though. There's no right, balance. It's all we're not under his presidency. It's all been no child left behind testing. And, w and what we need is these kids are still human beings first. Right. They're students second. They come to school, whatever issue. You saw, you know, generations of students, and Brian's referred to this, generations of students, families that haven't graduated from high school. We get that all the time. I'm going to be the first one to graduate from high school, right. and, and my mom is so looking forward to that. Well, it, it's because somebody like Patty said, hey, I want to talk to you about my program. I know you can get a diploma. What? I can get a diploma? And the kid's right. eyes will light up because she took the time of her busy schedule to say that. And once they have an opportunity and they know there's, a, there's hope, the kids usually respond. Have we ever had social workers in our schools, or is that, or is that something that you are aware of from other well, states? Well, we've had one in London Dairy, and the position was cut. Because, again, it goes back to okay. the funding mechanism in the towns. It's still, you know, it's still, it's still, you know, difficult. Again, what does every property tax any homeowner want? They don't want taxes to be higher. We're all, if we all own homes. I don't. Right. I don't either right, in right. Manchester where I live. But do you want to, then are you suggesting then a sales tax, a state income tax? I mean, nobody wants to I pay more taxes I said we should just go anywhere. offshore gambling. And why so, not? Offshore gambling? Is that what you Why said? not? Put the, okay. put the boats out and buy. Now, that's a serious consideration. Right. That's not and a. And you'll have plenty of money. I agree. People make their own choices. I don't want to pay anymore. I'm, my family, I know, we're working hard with, and I tell everybody, there's three people in this world that means the world to me, my three children. I know my wife's intelligent enough. She, she'll do all right if something happens to me. I watch out for those three kids. Lay the foundation down. The foundation's being laid now. We're not waiting till they're 16, 17 years old. The testing, like you're talking about testing. We make sure kids are well-rested, well-fed, everything before they go in to take a test. But that's, again, a team effort. Right. From two loving parents. You from know, two loving, educated, educated. parents who are right, exactly. fairly socially aware, right. and which is not a, what all these kids but have. But as a professional it's educator. It's overwhelming, though, because we both work hard. You know, I have a second job. You know, my wife's second job is to help the kids. We volunteer in town. We do all that. And it's not easy, but you make the time. And parents have to realize that. And as the good kids... They're gonna, they're gonna get the. And I yeah. shouldn't say the good kids. That's the wrong. That, that's the wrong. Right, thing I, to but say. I understand what you're saying. The, the motivated right. parents and the motivated students. Basically, they're gonna get there. And one of my biggest fears. I can drag kids into school all day. The 16 year old. I can, I can still physically get them in here. Do you want him sitting or her sitting next that's to the, question. the other student exactly. and then they get the bullying issues because they don't want to be there? Well, that's the question I would ask that nobody's brought up regarding this HB 18. It seems very common sense that, of course, we want our children in school through their high school years. On the other hand, uh, if your children are sitting in a classroom where there's a 16 or 17 year old, 180 pound year old, uh, 180 pound boy who doesn't want to be there, causing disruption and problems right. and is that that's not the answer either that's not what we want well I, I try to separate my role as a mom with my two kids my own two kids and my role as a professional you know long-term well, educational I leader that. but I, I try to do that um, because those are two different roles I think and they're two different set of criteria as as a an educator and an educational leader, I think that every student has a right to learn. And as a public education system, we educate the public. We educate every student. And philosophically and morally, I have to take that approach. That's why I'm supporting the dropout bill. But I think you have to create alternatives for students to make it a win-win situation. If a student is so highly disruptive, you need to have other places for them mm -hmm. to go to get their education. Because if you are acting out Street and you are YDC. checking out of your educational process and disengaging, then you there's something wrong and, and you're not able to function within that environment. So we have to create environments for students that can't succeed. Many times kids would rather be bad than dumb. Their reading level is so below grade level that they cannot read the, the material or do the work in the classroom. So they're acting out. And they, they want the teacher's attention, but in a class of 30 students, the teacher cannot give them the attention that they need to exceed you know, in a classroom setting. But that goes back to what we talk about with testing. There, in my mind, except for the, a very, very minimum number of students, 
there is no excuse for having a 14-year-old who can't read. Well, and that we're, we're putting enough money, certainly, into our school district that our students should be right. learning to read. Well, I, I philosophically disagree with you there mm -hmm. in that, you know, of course I want all students reading on grade level, but high-risk students, students that have emotional issues, um, family system crises, where there's no reading or no books in their homes, when I go on home visits to every home, it is highly unlikely for me to find any reading material. But again, in, you're in dealing with the, the minimum, you're dealing with the, the minority of students. I'm dealing with the small, students that are going to drop out. Students. Yeah, that are right. at risk of dropping out. But they are not, traditionally, the primary indicator for dropping out is not reading on grade level in third grade. That's when they start falling behind. So you're going to have 14-year-olds with second and third grade reading levels. And in the cognitive processing and, you know, brain beast research shows that everyone doesn't learn the same. And everyone doesn't necessarily have the same capacity or the same right. time frame for learning. And it's easy to say everyone should be on grade level. And of course, as an educator, I'd be like, you're right. Philosophically, yes, well, everyone and should be. I'm talking about the teachers, not the students, when I make that kind of a comment. Uh, we heard some of these students talk about, uh, several of them, you know, made comments about foundation classes, uh, that the, the way that they were treated by the academic system in their foundation classes helped to not motivate me. Uh, handing in, I could hand a paper in, and no matter what it said on it, they, I'd get credit for it. That didn't make me feel like I wanted to come to school. Um, you know, one of the students talked about, uh, you know, maybe we should just let the students take a GED at 16 and let them go if they want to, if they're already there. It seems to me that to some degree uh, we can talk about families and what these students face at home and we can talk about funding and uh, the necessity for social workers and substance abuse education. But to some degree maybe, maybe we have to uh, look at the idea that maybe our schools are, are not uh, meeting their, their obligation in every single case either. Well, I... Once again, I'm philosophically I, I'm you. happy to have you. And, I'm trying to play um, devil's advocate. I, That's thank okay. You. Um, in that, I, I fully support the teachers in the traditional settings. I cannot tell you how hard those folks work. And having a class of 30 plus students sometimes is an incredibly hard, hard thing to do in this day and age. And having then a disruptive one or two folks in, in your room is even harder. Because right. you can't get to the other people. You have to send the, uh, th those disruptive kids out of your room. Um, but that doesn't solve the problem, which is trying to reach the majority of your learners and get them to be educationally prepared and then also meeting the needs of every learner in your room. I think that everyone who comes on board as a teacher comes in with the mission to help all kids. But in the modern society and in the model that we have, it's hard to reach every well, student. And I'm not suggesting that any particular teacher isn't here, for, isn't teaching for the right reasons, but maybe I'm criticizing the model, as you call it, mm -hmm. more than the individuals. Um, you talked about teenage students who are below a third grade reading level. You're talking about students who are in first and second grade who just aren't showing up at mm -hmm. school. Right. Is our intervention coming too late? Is, is the alt school and the extra, the additional programs that you advocate, and is the intervention coming too late? Do we, well, we need don't to have, be doing have, something younger? We don't have public kindergarten. We don't. Or preschool. So, so or preschool. Kindergarten, kindergarten or preschool. So, yeah. you know, schools are calling me. I have a kindergartner who's been out 70 days. Mm -hmm. Well, legally, there's nothing I can do. I can go knock on the door, see if they moved and didn't tell anybody, or I can just say, hey, are you going to send your child to kindergarten? But other than that, my hands are tied. But is, is mandated kindergarten, the, the students who don't show up for first or second grade, are they any more likely to show up to a mandated kindergarten? I, I could get started earlier, right? basically. And uh, research uh, shows and that you need stop those. Stop the research for a minute, <laughs> all right? Let those There's researchers research. get off their fannies and get into these houses. That bugs me. But I don't care about the research. I care what I see. And that's kids not getting there. You can do all the research you want. You can have a mil pile of million books on the table in the classroom. If the kid's not there to get it, they're not going to get educated. But I think that you both... It's frustrating. Right. It's, it's very frustrating. And, and for myself, somebody who's, who doesn't face this as a challenge with my own kids, at least not yet, it's equally frustrating for me because like everybody at this table, I want the same thing for the kids in all mm -hmm. of our community. Mm -hmm. I want them all to have the equal opportunity. To, it not, it's not just that you want them to have the opportunity to education. You want them to have the opportunity to choose you know, their lives and their options when they're, when they're out of school. That's what our ultimate goal is. And, and I think that you're probably both very, you know, coming from the same place. The research 
clearly plays a critical role Absolutely. in how do we Thank approach you. these kids how do we, you know, what are the right ways to get, the, mm -hmm. get to them? On the other hand, you're seeing them every day and interacting with their families on a regular basis. And, and I think the most frustrating part of this, from my point of view, is how do we break the cycle? Exactly. The families, uh, and we saw that from the students themselves. Again, my grandfather, my uncle, my brothers were all dropouts. My, the, the one girl that broke my heart was my mother you know, has eight children and none of them have graduated from high school and she thought I was going to be the one. How do we break the cycle? I've, I've said for years that our high schools uh, should have some sort of mandated parenting course when st you know, freshman, right. sophomore, junior year so that when these students are out there raising kids of their own, there's some chance of breaking this cycle and decreasing the numbers. It's a very complicated problem. And um, the National Center for Dropout Prevention, which is the premier research agency and clearinghouse, shows that the number one thing you need to do across the nation is um, implement early learning models, such as kindergarten, preschool and, kindergarten. and preschool. And now it becomes a political issue for the dropout issue, which is really talking about 16, 18 year olds, but it's really going back to preschool and kindergarten. And I think you get a sense of that, too, listening to the students, that the young lady who talked about she had issues in junior high that followed her into right. high school. Mm -hmm. um, I was really sort of struck also by how many of those students talked about social problems that they had at school, behavioral problems, you know, however you want to um, kind of define that. How much of that, I'm curious, Brian, do you see as being from kind of beginning at home as well? A again, you're the one who's interacting directly with the families. Okay. Um, if a student misses a lot of school, they fall behind. They go into the school and any one of us would know if you haven't seen a group of people for a long time and you walk into the middle, even at a social gathering, right. you walk into the middle of a conversation, you don't know particularly what's going on. It's like you're perpetually the new kid in school. Exactly. So they might get picked on or they might feel nobody likes me, nobody's talking to me. And then they try and fit in where they don't fit in they start bullying or they get bullied mm -hmm. something happens so which then makes they, them not want to show up even more right well then they get in trouble mm -hmm. so they get a detention they miss a detention they get an extra detention they miss the extra detention then they get frustrated they might say something okay you're going to get in-house suspension i don't like it in in-house suspension fine you get out of suspension now the parents are getting called for the discipline problems parents are getting frustrated back to the single mother a single father getting overwhelmed, now the school's calling because the kid's being a pain in the neck. The kid's not only a pain in the neck there, they're pain in the neck at home, picking on the little brothers and sisters because this is what they're learning in school. It just kind of snowballs. The kid thinks everybody's, everybody hates them, except for the other student who's in the same boat. Right. So they latch on, and now they become best friends. We're not going to school, we're going to go hang out. I'll go over to his house, you call him, me out sick, I'll call you out sick. And it just keeps going. The single parent might be at work, school's trying to call the house, no answer, they leave a message, kid goes home and deletes it, gets the mail first, tears up any letters. Well, we're in the process in our school district of, be, of eliminating, <laughs> very frustrating, <laughs> as a parent and as a professional in the school district, I understand that. We, I know from uh, Superintendent Hoddle that we're about to, uh, we're on the verge of implementing this new electronic phone system. Mm -hmm where parents are automatically notified when their student's not there, where they can sign up and be notified at multiple phone numbers, cell mm -hmm. phone, work, home. It's going to be much more difficult for the student to intercede and, and get that message from, stop the message from getting to the parent. But we've come back again in this circle to the home and to the family and right. to the parents. Should we be um, should we be filing criminal charges against parents whose children are out of school I, for I 20 days? You do. I do. It's, what called is, duty, what is, it's called duty of a parent for compulsory education, and it's a violation. It's like, like a speeding ticket. It's time-consuming, but what I have to show is a serious adverse effect on their education. The problem is a special needs student or teachers mm -hmm. want to be nice because they don't want to pile on the student who's failing, right. so they pass them on the work they're doing when they're there. So it's hard to prove the it's adverse hard to effect. Prove it. But if that student getting, ends up in your school getting, below reading level. Um, it's, I mean, it's hard for the teacher to prove it on. It's hard for you I to prove could, it on your I end. Can prove the it adverse if effect. I am trying to educate the teachers on, the, again, the tough love. Right. Unfortunately, you got to fail this student 
so I can go into court and prove that they're not being in school is showing. But then you, you end up with a parent now who's angry and frustrated that I, they've been hauled into court, of course, and, and I, I, I hate and to think how some of them fine. react when they get home and have to face the child that's caused that. Yeah. On the other, it should, instead of a $250 fine, should the consequence be that you are now required to attend a six-month parenting course uh, or a six-month parenting and education course of some kind? A lot kind. of these parents have Because uh, I think the parents are, right, I think the parents, are, a lot get, of these parents are ill-equipped. Right, but to get them to go for six months, that would be, I hate to say it, beating your head against the wall, we're right back to where we started because they're not going to show. Now what are you going to do? I guess now you're sending the police out to get them, the parents who are insured from I, it, I think, a, a, bad, a bad cycle to start. I think, Jennifer, before we end this, I think we also have to look at, at educators. We're not perfect, and education reform is necessary. A lot of teachers, unfortunately, and educators do not have the child first. Okay? They, they go into the field for whatever reason, and they may be dedicated, but sometimes they do say, why don't you drop out? Guidance counselors mm -hmm. say that. I, you know, one of the students said that, that, that I, yeah. found that dis I found that disturbing, that a guidance counselor had said to a student, one of your options is you can drop out. But if you're a risk taker in education, and you don't go by the clock, and you're willing to try things, and you're willing to work diligently with that child, sometimes you do become that surrogate parent, so to speak. But just look at an eighth to ninth grade transition. What would be so wrong with looping the same teachers? We do it in elementary school. Wouldn't it be great if that, that student, that at-risk student, goes to ninth grade and they've had the same teachers for history and, and English that they had the year before? Mm -hmm. Familiar faces. But we're also predicated by grades one through five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, that sometimes it's very difficult for superintendents, for principals, for all of us to think that we should be different. Anything can work if you try it. It might cause surprises to that, mm -hmm. that uh, principal say, what do you mean you want to have the student do an independent study and have his English taken at you know, another school or through this uh, tutorial organization? What do you mean? So I mean, if, if, if you want to try that, the kids do respond. I mean, it's just very difficult, it's sad, you know, you know, Brian sees it. We all see it. It's very sad to see these, you know, younger ch children uh, in, in homes that aren't appropriate. You know, but if a kid will still respond, 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds still respond. We're all for everybody staying in school. We'd love 100% mm -hmm. to graduate. Mm -hmm. I just think that take the best practices model. Find the school districts that are doing wonderful things. Publicize that. Get the two-year Vogue schools, the community co colleges, and all the state to start doing things with seniors and letting them go to college. You might be very surprised at such a wonderful thing. Franklin has dr had a dropout mm -hmm. rate decrease, immense dropout rate from some intervention strategies and money they got from the federal government because their dropout rate was so high. But it came from the feds. But now we have to be willing to try yeah, new options. Absolutely, absolutely. no we matter what it is. The box. Absolutely, right. got to. You have and, to. And we can't blame. We can't blame parents. We can't blame teachers. We can't blame the kids. We can't We're blame poverty. We have to all work together right. toward a solution for these kids. Well, you can't blame, but we do. There has to be some level of I don't know if it's responsibility or accountability. <laughs> that's right. Somehow, well, and that's right. But, I mean, I, I agree with you that it's not going to help for four of us to sit around the table and saying it's the teacher's fault, yeah, it's right. the parents' no. fault, it's the kids' fault. Uh, everybody wants the best for these exactly. kids. There's no question about it. And I have to say, I really particularly appreciate the uh, the dedication and the emotion, the commitment, just mm -hmm. from the three of you at this table. Because it, it is encouraging to know that the, the professionals who are out there dealing with the kids take this seriously and you know have the same love and the same dedication that you know some parents feel for it. If you just but, take that tape and show it to any politician, state rep, or all the all the person or school board, they just gave all the reasons why kids drop out of school. All the reasons mm -hmm. you know have been have been enunciated on the tape. There it is. Now, do we have strategies for intervention? or education around all those issues. Well, let's wrap up by talking just a little bit about strategies. I know nobody has the perfect answer at the table today, but, uh, and you sort of just set the stage for it, it has to include teachers, it has to include parents, it has to include the community, it ha awareness, programs, funding. What is, you know, just in your personal experience, what is the strategy? What do you think is the direction we should be heading in to try I to resolve I think Brian this? talked before, and I think it's really clear that and Patty certainly reiterated that we have to do things at the lower level. If a student's behind, mm -hmm. 
behind in reading at second grade, why wouldn't they offer a summer enrichment, maybe paid for by the school district or partially mm -hmm. funded to get that child into a very positive situation like one of the students mm -hmm. mentioned with low class numbers and a teacher to help those kids in a non-threatening environment get their scores up. In, in my setting, I think that my school has to be expanded to be a 6th through 12th grade program in its own building um, with two, my dream has always been to have two vocational community based programs, one around a cafe, one around woodworking, to give kids the skill sets and the interaction with the community. Um, I think there needs to be more community service based learning projects for kids because connecting them with their community is so important because statistics show that, that a lot of high risk and seriously high risk kids don't ever leave their community. So we have to model good citizenship and, and create good citizens. I think we also need to, like Mike was saying, look at best practices, look at what works in other communities and, and continue to, to make that part of, of the tapestry that we're weaving and continue to make those interconnected web of supports for high-risk kids. K through 12 decision-making curriculum. Call it what you want. Decision-making on, you know, peer issues. Mm -hmm. Decision-making on, um, you know, talking about substances, about going to the right people, bringing allotene into the schools for mm -hmm. kids affected it, by it alcoholism. It sounds like values teaching to but some degree as well. But a lot of times well. the, the so-called administrators, and I am one, so I'm criticizing <laughs> myself, don't want that name of allotene in your school because then you're admitting that you actually might have substance problems. Right. And, and, if and of course all the schools have substance every, problems. Every, no so the United States does. I mean, right. Trace. Every community. 99% nine, nine, nine right, right. of, I'm sure, the crimes committed in every community are related to drugs and alcohol now with all of the robberies and break-ins. But why wouldn't you do something on a continuum from the time they come into the building based on their age and development all the way through senior year of high school on values, decision-making, bring in your guest speakers, bring in past graduates, but make it a goal of that community to have that in place. That's just as important as teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. And you spoke earlier the the importance of early intervention right. as well. From I'd like to see five, if you know, with this open checkbook, five different types of school. Have an alternative school for the square peg, round hole type student. Have the traditional school for traditional kids that want to go just go to college. The focus, that's their goal. Have a vocational high school, a regional vocational high school, true type atmosphere. As I. I want to say a plumber told me last year that the average age of a plumber in New Hampshire is like 54 years old. We don't have plumbers. We have the um, programs in the vocational high school. They, we have them, but they, don't, they can't get until junior year. Right. So, so that's so it. If we can get these kids into sophomore year, we can have them take pre-vocational courses in grade 9 and then enroll them. But again, it's been 11th and 12th right. the since box. the beginning of time right. in New Hampshire. Yeah. And then yeah. you take a base back to like a reform school. Keep these kids safe in the building. Keep them so they're not bullied. And I know these kids, I feel awful. I get a kid back in school and I'm saying, holy mackerel, I hope nothing happens. Right. Because it's, it's there, the potential's there. And if people have blinders on, they're crazy. Well, we know uh, it that it happen. happens. We hear the stories right. all the time. And get those kids to a form type school and get them to toe the line. And well, they need a different type of intervention exactly. than those students. And then reintegrate them back in a public school. And it'd be public school, I shouldn't say it that way. But keep yeah. building safe, you know. Just keep the kid, well, the square peg around the hole who might get afraid. Take care of those kids. Those kids, you lose and they, they're intimidated, you know. And educate the others. You said with an open checkbook, I can't help but wonder if we are, I think you're all essentially saying the same thing and, and maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but it seems as if our traditional school system just doesn't, is no, it's no longer the answer by itself. No. It can't work by itself. And I'm not convinced it any longer addresses the needs of the majority of students. It, it seems as though students have been broken down into so many different categories, so many different types of learners, mm -hmm. so many different home environments, that maybe it's time when we're talking about education funding, and education in general, and dropout rates, and 
low reading scores and children who don't show up for school in first grade and the need for kindergarten and preschool intervention. Maybe it's time for a real education summit in the state of New Hampshire that addresses the entire issue in its, in its wholeness and comes up with a solution that's going to work for the state of New Hampshire in the long run, for the long term. There are too many, it's, if nothing else, what I've learned from this conversation is that there are a whole lot more elements to the issue of dropping out than I realize coming in. A whole lot more in, influencing uh, pieces to but this. But one thing that's constant in all my years is if there's one person, just one person in that child's life, somewhere along the way, that stays the course with that child, whether it be Brian and his, his tough love role, or whether it be Patty as the principal of her alternative school, or whether it be me as the guidance mm -hmm. counselor person, whatever I am, or any teacher or coach, and they continue to work with that child, that child will respond. They respond. As long as you're there, you can't say one day I'm here for you, Jennifer, and the next day right. I'm gone. The kids know within an instant when they walk into any school, any level, which teachers care, which other staff care. They, they're smart, they're savvy, and they know right away. And, and ideally, obviously, the parent to be the one who's consistently there, care, giving the message that you're loved and you're mm -hmm. cared for. Thank you very much to all three of you. I've enjoyed having you. This is uh, yeah, one of those topics. To on I was going to say, this is one of those issues where I think we could easily talk about sure. it for, for hours as, as it unfolds. And especially, I also want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you for joining, for this, joining us for this edition of On Education. And if you'd like to see this one again or email us, you can go to the website at nhs-tv at nashua.edu. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you to our panel as well. Thank you. Thanks.